I live in this subdivision. I know the property values. The comps are all going to be around 105. Um, the house, I've walked the house. The house needs uh, probably 10 to 15,000 in repairs. I'm pretty good on my repair comps because I've been in construction all my life. And uh, I would sell the house for 65. I'm in. There you go. See that how easy that was? I mean, we're talking about selling your house within how, how many minutes? Seconds. 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 Yeah, it's not even minutes. It's like less than 30 seconds. You only get a buyer. Just in case Gustavo can't perform, my number is. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's <laughs> right. It's 832-217-9986. And if any of you need help on looking at houses, repair costs and stuff like that, I'd be happy to walk houses with you. Eight three two. I'm not going to do it for free. Eight three two two one seven nine nine eight six. I've I've been in construction since about 1975. And uh, Jerry Jerry Scribner S C R I B N E R. I have two beautiful teenage daughters. I'm going to put through college, so I need your help. Eight three two two one seven nine nine eight six. Email address, by the way, is very creative. Sell your house fast at ev1.net. Okay, you guys should always have a backup buyer. Okay, do, do not settle for just one buyer. So, is there any backup buyer that potentially are interested in Jerry's deal? There you go. So that's that's your backup buyer. Uh, the more backup buyer you have, the better. Okay, so I don't stop looking for buyers after I sign up a contract with one buyer. I always put a backup buyer in place. So, I mean, it, you know, it happens all the time. The, for some reason, the buyer can't perform. Now you have someone to, to, to uh, fall back on. Okay, any, any other deals? You can bring that one up, Joel. It's okay if they're out of state, right? What your buyer's out of state, no, or the property. the property's out of state? Well, then you would have to find a buyer that's willing to buy the property out of state. Okay, we've got a group of six houses. They are occupied. They are currently rented. In other words, they don't need repairs. Three are on lease purchase options. They are appraised at four hundred forty thousand. I would wholesale them at 390000 You've got immediate equity. You have immediate rental income. Okay. One is a duplex. They are in, they are in Indianapolis, Indiana. I will, um, when, we, when we get started, like really started, I'll give you some websites that you can post on, those deals on, and you'll find buyers from other states that are interested in them. Um, I've got a house with very motivated sellers. They've moved themselves into another bigger house, so they're making dual pay payments. Um, the house doesn't really need much, maybe $2,000 to you know, kind of spruce it up a little bit. Um, I'm looking to get my uh, house um, noticed by um, more end user or maybe landlords, and I've been marketing the property. I've, have, I've got it under contract for 72. Comps in the area are between 84 and 88. Nice to eight neighborhoods, 2-1, but I can't seem to get that type of attention to the property. Well, okay, well, landlord's probably not going to be interested in that deal. I mean, there's not enough e equity in it. You have it under contract for 72? Yes. Okay. So your strategy is to sell it to an end buyer? Right. Yeah, and so when we get to that part, uh, the, when we get to the bonus um, part of the event, you, you you get some tips on how you could do that. Okay, it's located in Texas City, by the way. D the, does it need any repairs at all? It, it needs minimal repair. They had a dog. What, 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 are, what is minimal? Like uh, what well, they time? had a dog in the backyard, and it kind of ate some of the siding off of the back okay. and scratched up like the back door. Okay. Um, and it, it needs paint. The carpet's fine. It's mm. got tile, uh, ceramic well, tile. When you say it needs paint, I mean, is it because it's dirty, or is it because just of dirty, the paint color? Dirty, yeah. It just, it's Okay. Dull, because they've been living in there. Okay. Yeah. One, just to ha give you a really quick tip, 
uh, one, one strategy would be to do a big open house. So you put out a lot of signs all around that neighborhood and you're gonna get, find a mortgage broker either in this room or find one that's familiar with uh, FHA type loans because that house will fall under that category. And you can advertise $500 down and in that case, it'll probably be like 700 something dollars a month. And, and then you have the open house sign with the arrow pointing to the house. You put about 30 of those all around the neighborhood and you do a, an open house on Saturday and Sunday. And you get your buyers list pretty quickly. You take that buyers list, give it to that mortgage broker, and they'll, they'll start calling the buyer and get them pre-qualified. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I don't have a deal, but uh, now I'm a newbie and never done a deal, you know, as far as this. But uh, I noticed how he jumped up real quick. Where is this money? Where are they getting this money from to, uh, to, to make deals like this? <laughs> I mean, you know, I'd love to jump on a deal right quick, but I mean. Yes, know, we, we, we talked about private lenders and hard money lenders. Right. So that's what you do. You, as long as the deal meets their criteria, like would a, um, would a private lender you know, a lot of them, they will loan up to 70%. If you have a good relationship with them, they'll op even loan it up to 80% of, of value. And so you build relationships so you know that they'll be able to perform. But if you're not sure, you get it under contract anyways. Don't do it to other wholesalers in this class. Uh, but um, you get it under contract and then you go and ask for, for your private lender, hey, will you lend me on this deal? Yeah. That's correct, uh -huh. yes. Just to answer your question, um, I have done real estate for about five years now. I own property in Mexico, got a couple of houses, empty lots. From there, God and my wife got me to buy this house 10 years ago in California, got it for 128, sold the last year for 575,000. Prior to that, we bought a, a house in Barstow going towards Vegas for 61,000, sold it for 98,000, and then we got four units in, um, five units actually, one, it was illegal, but anyway. Four units in um, San Bernardino County. We got it for 219, sold it for 417. Wow. So all of this, I did it to retail. So yeah. If I wouldn't know this and done it wholesale, then I'd be more money involved. But to answer your question is, his property, let's say he give it to me for 70,000, which I need four properties yesterday, 20% down that thank God I had the money, that would be $14,000, I can get it like that. And my mortgage lender, he would give me money to fix it, so that's no problem. And if anybody has money problems, and either one of you find a house in 59 and Bellwood A inside, and if, even if you don't find it inside the Bellwood A, then you drag me down to, um, what's the name of that city? Outside the Bellwood A, I would consider paying you $6,000, not only five. Give me at least 28, 30% equity. I don't mind spending another 10 or 9% to fix it up. We have a deal. I mean it. You need my car, I give it to you. I needed a house last week, and I need two more houses by the end of uh, November. There so you go. Help me out. There you go. Don't, don't take away all my deals now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always contact me through emails. That's the best way. Um, because I... Chris, you actually you have Christine's card in your binder that that thousand uh, dollar bill. So if you have any deals you want to wholesale, you contact her, because I'm not the one that that does the buying and selling in my business. She does it. So if you contact me, it just get forwarded to her. Uh, I, I don't really look into it. He's out. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a property off of Westheimer in Kirkwood. It is worth 255. I have it under contract for 206, and the repairs are about two to three thousand dollars. Probably a little less than that. Where is this? Westheimer in Kirkwood. <laughs> West no, Simon. no, I'm, I'm, yeah, Westheimer in Kirkwood, right under the Beltway. Okay, okay. Mm, it's a four, two and a half, two, two story. What's the situation with the seller? She's pre foreclosure. How how far in the game? Uh, about three months. Three months. So mm -hmm. it's not scheduled for auction yet. It right? was, but I did what you told me to do. The hood. <laughs> Good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, well, for for your situation with that pre foreclosure deal, once they postpone it, 
what you need to do is you, you really need to do the five-day auction on it. Okay, yeah. And I'll go into that a lot more detail in just a little bit. So I'm giving you guys different strategies, you know, because, I mean, every deals are different. I can't just go up here and tell you you need to buy all your deals at 60% or, or, or less, and that's the only way you make money. Because if, if, if that's all I teach you, then, I mean, your chance of success is going to be a lot less. It's about knowing your, knowing your buyers, how much your buyer is willing to pay, knowing what you can sell a house for, and that way it determines how much you can buy that house. And a lot of, a lot of you, it's not that you can't find deals. It's that you don't know how to structure the deal to make, make it profitable for you. And, <laughs> and, and I mean, it's, I've, I've seen that over and over. Uh, Doug Smith, a lot of you guys know him. Before, before I met him, he was doing a bunch of marketing already because he, he've already learned some of these things. And you know, he, so he got leads continually coming in. He just didn't know how to work those deals. So as soon as he, he met me and we agreed uh, to work on, that time I did a one-on-one -on -one mentorship with him and he's supposed to split his six, first six deals with me. Well, we found his uh, first six deals within like, I think, uh, only a few weeks because he already had all these leads. He just didn't knew, know how to make them profitable. He didn't know how to turn them into deals. So that was an easy job that I did. <laughs> Good for you, Tim. Uh, guys, sorry, I just need to clarify something. I don't need a property north side. I need it south side, which is near Stafford. He doesn't want it Stafford, but if the price is right, I convince him. He wants to be, Bedward A in 59, he wants to be on the west side of 59 inside Bedward A. If the price is right, we have a deal. And I need uh, more than one house, please. Stuffer is outside, I don't mind, but uh, he doesn't want to be there, but if the price is right, he will be there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Joel, you want to talk about one of your deals? Do you have your comps, or do you need me to pull it? You didn't, pr okay, I'll pull, I'll pull it up. Hold on, let me get the address. Do you have the property info report or anything? I got the, the, okay, I got so, the so I can get the subdivision. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, can I, can, can I, um, can I pick on you on this? Sure. You guys can do something like this with your Ticklow file. I mean, this is, this is how Joe organized all his, all his deals, but, I used to carry these around with all the, with the contracts that I need. And also, if you convert this into a tickler file, or you don't have to put the whole 30 days in there. You can just put like per week. So each week, you just take the, that, um, that week's folder and you put it in here. So as you drive around or as you go through your day, and you just pick it out, and you can make your phone calls in the cars. You, you, you don't have to be at home. Okay, yeah. these are his active deals. Can you see? Wow. Um, Joe's a... Huh? <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, I wouldn't talk about it if I didn't already have one of the contracts. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Wow, that's a lot. All right. Okay. Tell me, tell everybody about this deal. Is that Crandon? Uh, Crandon, yes. Yeah. Uh, that house is near 59 in Cavalcade. Um, I figured it would probably be worth somewhere around 50, between 50 and 60,000. Uh, it's already rented. It doesn't really need any work unless you're just trying to pretty it up. Um, you know, siding's in good shape, roof's in good shape. It's already rented. You know, so other than just maybe slapping some paint and carpet in it, there wasn't really much to do. Okay, okay. And how much is it rented? Being rented uh, I for? forgot. I want to say it's something around four fifty, five hundred bucks. Is it I'm, a long-term rental? Guessing. Yeah, the guy the guy wanted to buy it, but uh, I had the cash and he didn't, so okay. I'm buying it, not him. Gotcha. Okay. So I, I may own or finance it to him if if I don't find somebody else that wants the house. Uh, is this a 
Let me see here. This is a two bedroom, one bath. It, uh, it crawl is. Space. They uh, they built an addition on the back of the house, so theoretically it could be a three bedroom. But does, I mean, was it a Wally done? Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's not falling in like some I've seen. <laughs> okay. It's, you can actually live there and not think anything. I mean, there's a okay. window AC unit in it and everything. So yeah. So you you can tell that it wasn't original, but it looks okay. 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 And I see here it is a crawl space. So the square, f the actual square footage, including the addition, should be more than what the HCAT is saying. It says 968. Yeah, it's bigger. Okay. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned to you guys uh, yesterday, this is in the low-income neighborhood, and if it's a two-bedroom house, a crawl space like this, you, you are looking between fifty and fifty-five thousand dollars. But because of the addition with the three-bedroom, now you can push it between sixty to sixty-five thousand dollars. Okay. Um, so without doing comps, I, I know that much about it, uh, simply because of the neighborhood that it's in. But just, just to guys give you guys a good idea, I will be running the comps right now, just so you guys can see what I look for when I, when I run my comps, OK? Sounds good? Is it up? Uh, let me see. Tim, I have a tablet PC, and on the contracts, is there a way I can, well, I, I know I can do it, but um, I, if I pull the contract over into a file, I can literally sign the contract with a, a digital pen. Is that legal, or do I need an ink pen in order to sign contracts? Uh, digital pen is fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the trick part is how you're going to print it out and, and give it to your seller. I can print it out on a uh, little portable printer, or I can email it to them. Okay, yeah, Th then that's fine. Yeah, send it as a fax. Yeah, that, that's fine. Yes. Um, he's passed out along with those pictures, but that's okay. You can pass out now or later. It doesn't really matter. You can pass out on the break. I'll tell everybody to go back there and pick one up. How's that? Okay, I'll make it easier. Okay, this is the, okay, yeah, that, that'll be good. Um, so let's pull some comps first and then we'll look at the pictures. This is the Houston area MLS um, software, it's called Temple. This is what real estate agents use. So if you have access to this, you log in and you click on search. Before you, before you search here, you need to be able to either use the, your county appraisal districts and use their website and pull up the property report like this, or you can use the property info if you're in the Houston area and you, you print out the report. So you put in the address of the property and it will return you back with all the information about the, um, that property. Okay, so you would know what the subdivision it's in, the square footage, the number of bedroom, bathroom, there's owner's information, so you get all that. Okay. So in this case, the subdivision name is Oak Park. Okay, you want to select everything active, pending, and sold. And depending on the neighborhood, you may or may not care to put the number of bedroom and bath uh, in here. But for the purpose of this, this presentation, I'm not going to put that in so you can see more results that will come back. To get a more accurate um, comps, on square footage, you want to only use like plus or minus um, 
you know, 10 to 20 percent, depending on, the, again, depends on the neighborhood, depends on the size of the, 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 um, the house also. But th let's say this house is 1,000 square feet. I like to only use either from 900 square feet to 1,100 square feet or from 850 square feet to 1,150 square feet. And the, the way I decide that is how many comps that I got back. So if I get at least three comps back, then I'll use the, the lower number. But if I get uh, um, less, less comps, then I'll use a wider range to give me a better picture, OK? In this case, I'm not going to put anything in. I want to see what's coming back in that neighborhood so I can let, let you guys know. For your year built, you want to find houses that within about five years a difference. So this house was built in, in 1946. Well, in older homes like this, anything that were built in, in, in the 60s and older would be fine. Uh, but if a house was built in, say, 1980, then you would want to use comps that were of houses that were built from 1975 to 1985. Okay? So plus or minus five years. You guys got that? First is plus or minus uh, 10 to 15 percent of the neighborhood, uh, of the square footage. Just, just to make it easy on you, just plus or minus 15 percent. And then for year built is plus or minus five years. Those are the two things that I look for the most in comps, is the square footage and the year built. Um, other factors like number of bedrooms and, and number of bathrooms and swimming pools, they become secondary factors. They're not my primary factors. OK, and you want to find houses that were sold within the last six months. So we would do 401. And if you can't find it within the last six months, then you can change it and go out to a year. But when the appraiser appraised the house, they only use within the last six months. They will go outside of that, uh, of that immediate subdivision if they have to, 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 find, to find the comps that they need. OK, Oak Park has a lot of things that come up because there are other subdivisions that has other things after Oak Park. So we are going to. Na yes, narrowed in a little bit by putting in the key map page. And that's another thing that you need to be able to catch because sometimes there, there could be two subdivisions that have the same name. And you're, you're looking at the comps and you're like, wow, it has really good comps. And then you look at the key map page of where it is and you're like, whoa, it's two completely different areas of town. And so you have to watch that always. In this case, the key map is 454W, but I'll just put 454 for now. OK, see now when we have two. All right. Here is a house that's currently active. It's not yours, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> Here's someone else trying to sell their house. It's only been on the, uh, on the market for three days. It's 859 square feet. They're trying to sell it for um, $75,000. It's a two bedroom, one bath. So this house is going to sit on the market for a while. Okay. Let's, let's look into it a little bit. Yes, it's all fixed up. Very nice looking. 1956, yes. Uh -huh. Let's see what else it has, OK? Can everybody see it pretty clearly? Good. All right, let's look at some remarks here. Um, let's see. Okay. All right, two bedroom, one bath, de detached garage. So it does have a garage. Um, let's look at. Some of the description here, beautiful home has been completely redone. 
updated everything, blah, blah, blah. So it's also, okay. So basically, it's all fixed up. It's a nice looking house. So it could be from, a, from an investor. But I think he's just really um, overpricing himself. I'm looking for it right now. So it is. What is the lot size of the house? It didn't say it on here. It's supposed to be right here, but it's not here. Uh, we can. What we can do is we can pull up the um, tax account, the HCAT on it. Remember the the back door link? Is that familiar to you guys? There you go. <laughs> um, okay. The lot size here is. You see it. So, Oh, right here, 6,500. So pretty small. Um, sits on two or three lots. Okay, maybe that's why. If if it sits, well, that's really small lots. If it's sitting on two lots. Oh yeah, you see that lot 19 and lot 20. Okay, okay, yours is on two lots. Okay. It looks like there's two houses here. There's not? OK. All right. Yeah, let me see. Let me look at. <laughs> yours is on three lots, lots 33, 34, and 35. So yours is on three lots. But apparently, these lots are really small. Because you have 6,500 square feet, and there's two lots on, he on here. It's, it's kind of small. Let's assume, okay, let's assume this was 12,000 square feet lot. And this house sits on one side of, the, of that big lot. You can actually subdivide that lot and now you have two lots. So you can sell one house and one lot or you can build up that house and sell two, lot, two houses. Um, and, and so you could do that. It's pretty easy. You just contact the city and get them to come out They'll require that each bedroom has at least one car space. So as long as your lot, once you build a house that there's enough space for one car per bedroom, then you're okay. That's how you know whether or not you can divide it up. I tried to divide this big lot into five before, and I couldn't do it because of that uh, requirement. What's the requirement again? For Houston anyways, okay? When you call them, it's one car space per bedroom. So if you build a one bedroom house, you only need one car space. If you build a two bedroom house, they need two car space. It doesn't mean a garage, it just means a driveway, but a car space. For each house, yeah. Yeah, it, it could be in front of the house where, as if they were to park like in the carport, yeah. The car driveway, the house driveway. No, it doesn't have to be between the house. No, gotcha. it could. The houses could be right next to each other, where there's like n hardly any dividing line. You you see a lot of these uh, sub subdividing in in the um, in the areas that are coming back, like in some of your third ward area, your historical uh, historic districts areas, because you know now people are building condos and. Um, and, and town homes, so they, they tear out, they tear down some of these older homes, and subdivide the lot so they can sell more, um, more properties because the the lot value, uh, you know, is worth over a hundred thousand dollars for a lot. There was a house that I was working on. I mean, the lot was like really, really small. It's only two thousand something. Yeah, and 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 the lady was trying to sell that house to me. I think it was for. Um, Seventy or eighty dollars, eighty dollars. I'm sorry, eighty thousand dollars. Seventy or eighty thousand. I don't remember. But the house across the street was selling for two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. But I, I, I didn't buy it because the the way the lot was um, was arranged because it actually it used to be one big lot. She divided it into four, and she so yeah. So now this lot becomes like the little bitty lot, uh, it's, and it's the last one left. And so it was so small that I can't, I can't uh, really build a house on it. I mean, you can't sell the house that it, that's sitting there. It's, I mean, it's a teardown, okay? 
You can't sell that house and get $230,000 for it. You would have to build you know, a much nicer one. But the, the, there's no, that's not enough space for me to, to build a new house. So, so yeah, when, whenever I see more than one lot, I, I pay a little closer attention to see if there's a possibility that I can subdivide them up. Okay. So as you can see, this Joel's property is, is um, in Oak Park subdivision, but this one that we're looking at is in Oak Park hair subdivision. But, but because the key map is 454W, which is the same as his, it's close enough that you can use the same comps. Okay. Huh? Yes, it's right down the street, exactly. In a lot of these older subdivisions, um, the, the name of this, the subdivision change a lot. So you can have one neighborhood, but it has like you know, three or four names of subdivisions. In the newer subdivisions, we don't have that problem. We have sections instead of the different names. But in the older ones, instead of dividing into sections, they just name it differently. So that's where the key map page comes into play. Okay, let me go back here. Because we don't have any comps here. We really can't use I mean you only have one sold comps. And it was sold for thirty three thousand dollars. Okay? That means that it's probably a fixer upper and investor bought it. Look, it took them eight hundred eleven days to sell that thing. All right, let's look at it. It's a big house. Ooh. Oh how ugly is ugly? Yeah, is <laughs> I mean, is this ugly enough? Um, but a as you can see, somebody bought it for $33,000. And what did I tell you guys that we, we, we will buy these houses for? Yeah, right, 15 to 20,000 or 20 to 25,000. So if you had bought this house for 25,000, you would have made $8,000 on this deal, right? <laughs> and, and, and for you to, yeah. And sometimes what you can do, and I've done this in the past, if I'm in a subdivision where there's not a whole lot of comps or I might not find a buyer, um, what I'll do, look, it's a cash sale, so it's definitely from an investor. I'll call this agent that sold the house and ask that agent if the buyer is interested in my, my other house. So like for you, Joe, that, w that would be one of your buyers right here. So that's a really good tip to find buyers. You look at the comps, who's buying in that area. If it's an investor, you call up the agent and get the agent to, um, to, to, to see if the, the buyer wants it. But yeah, $33,000 of rehab of buying this house is very typical. Okay, we can look more into it here, if you guys want to look more pictures. Can't see it very well, but I mean, it's not, not horrible, yeah, it's not that bad. Would you consider going back for the, maybe a whole year? Or Which is what we're doing right now. Okay. Yeah, I, I always start with six months. And if I can't find anything in six months, then I'll go back to a year to give me a better picture. But for these low-income neighborhood, I already gave you guys the comps of what they are. So even if you don't have any comps, you know what the value is. Okay. So let's... Hey, Tim, when you suggested that he go back and use that agent, are the, are the fees the same for wholesaling if you use that agent? You use that agent, and you, you're going to have to pay them 3% of whatever uh, your, their buyer is going to, to, to buy the, the house from you for. So there'll be, there'll be your wholesale fee, and there's an agent commission. On, on, 
well, it will be taken out of your wholesale fee. Yeah, so let's say if you got that house under contract for $25,000 and you, you sold it to that buyer for $33,000, so you're paying the, their agent the 3% of that $33,000. So what is that? $1,000. So now your, your wholesale fee is only $7,000 that you made. Only. Yeah, only, yeah. It's kind of pathetic. <laughs> no, I mean... But on that comment, like when I sold my property in California, I got a broker and I told him, listen, I'm going to sell this apartment, but I'm going to buy a house. Mm -hmm. So if you knock me down, because you know California, they want six, seven, eight percent, they're crazy. Yes. I said, you charge me two, two and a half percent for your uh, buyer, but I'll give you three percent and the other one, when I buy it, I buy it through you. So I basically exactly. I work out their commissions. Remember their commissions. If they're, one, if they're hungry enough to take a cut, they will. Yeah. Especially, you know, you're an investor and you give them three, four properties a year? A agents are just as hungry as you guys are or more? They're more. They're more. <laughs> Trust me, they're more. <laughs> okay, they're a lot more hungry than you guys. So if you pay them more commission than what other people are willing to pay, they'll work harder in, in finding the buyer for you. So like if I, a lot of time, you know, if, if I'm having trouble selling a house on the retail market, I'll put, you know, 3% plus 1% BTSA, meaning an additional 1% it's BTSA stands for bonus to selling agents. So the agent that brings me a buyer will get a total of 4% commission instead of the normal 3%. And so you can do things like that. Or if you even get more aggressive, you know, and, and, and give them 5 or 6% and let them, you know, keep the whole, all that commission. If you're going to go that route, then you might as well auction the house off. Uh, but, you know, but if not, if you just want the agents to bring you the buyer, uh, pay them more commission instead of showing, bless you, instead of showing other houses in that neighborhood, they will show your house instead you know, because they make a whole lot more money showing your house. Okay, so we are going to go back for one year. You know what, instead of going back for one year first, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take out Oak Park and just leave the key map page 454. I should get a lot more. Okay, I got too much. <laughs> so let me see. Um, let me put 4W4. 4, 4, 454W. Okay, I got another one. So that's not too bad. All right, this is a retail comp here. This is a good one. $65,000 for a two bedroom, one bath. So you can look into it to see if it sits on a slab or it sits on a foundation. Yeah, 112 days on the market, that's not bad at all for Houston, okay? There you go, that's the house. It's pretty decent, see, and it has a one-car garage. Um, not bad, not a bad house. Construction, Right here, foundation is slab. There you go. That's the reason why I was able to sell for 65. Remember what I said about two bedroom house on the slab? See, I'm, I mean, without even looking at these, um, these comps, I already know. And, and, and now you guys already know. So when you talk to the sellers, you know, and that's applicable to pretty much all the low income neighborhoods here in Houston. Okay. In the moderate income neighborhoods, they're different. I do have to run comps unless it's in an area that I farm. So certain areas that I farm, I mean, I, I know right away what the value is. So you want to be an expert in, in, in the areas that you farm. So that way you, you're not dependent on your comps to, if the seller call you at midnight, you know, and, and, you, and they said, well, I, I, need a, I, I need to sell my house now. <laughs> you know, you, you pretty much know the comps. You're like, okay, I'll meet you in, in, in 20 minutes or something. <laughs> no, you never have to buy houses at midnight. But I have sellers calling me like late at night or first thing in the morning, you know, six, seven o'clock in the morning. They're already calling. Uh, yeah, before before they go to work. What, um, my 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 first rehab deal. The seller called me at um, sometimes seven o'clock in the morning. She didn't she didn't even leave me a message. Um, and 
at that time I had the, the phone ring to my cell phone num the phone number goes to my cell phone. So I was able to see her call ID and I called back and left her a message and that's how I got the deal signed up. So you know if, if you have a phone that's dedicated for deals, you'd be able to track that. One way you can do that, uh, that if you don't have a phone dedicated for that, you can sign up for like one of those uh, those voicemail service. Here, here, there's many different companies that you can use, uh, but one of them that I use here in Houston, well, I'll give you two of them, and you can. One is International Voice Exchange of Houston. It's ivxhou.com. I V X V S and Victor International Voice Exchange H O U dot com I V X H O U dot com Call Deborah uh, Debbie and just tell her Tim sent you. There's another company is A Better Answer dot com. They're a bigger company. They're, I have they have office here in Houston and in Dallas and I think San Antonio also. A better answer .com. So what you, you set up a, a voicemail box with them and you can have that voicemail box um, for the sellers to leave a message or you can have that forward the call to, to your cell phone number or your home number. But the important thing is you want to be able to get a call report, caller ID report. So now you can always backtrack. Let's say everybody that call you that day you'll be able to get their call, uh, call ID number. If you want to get more advanced than that, you sign up for a, uh, a toll-free number, like an 800 number or 877-888 number. With the toll-free number is that even if their caller ID is blocked, when it goes through a toll-free number, it, it, it still displays it. It will unblock that. So blocked IDs doesn't, uh, is not applicable for toll-free numbers. So you can do that. And you can sign it up with these companies. With, uh, if you've got uh, high-speed internet, you can get Vonage. Yes, you can get Vonage. Vonage is $25 a month for unlimited long distance, you know, and everything else. Plus, uh, you can get the 800 number for $5 a month extra. Will they give you a, a call ID report? You know, I'm pretty, it, they're, I'm, they will. They, okay. Yeah, okay. you can do it all on, on the internet site, okay, too. Okay, so very Vonage extensive. will, will, it's only for $25 a month. You, it's a voice over IP, um, voice over IP type s uh, phone system. And so, and they will, yeah, confirm with them, but if they do give you the call ID report, it's very critical because, you know, a lot of times sellers call you and they don't leave a message. But make sure that you know that phone number is only for sellers. So you have no other people calling you. So anybody that call you on that phone number, you know it's a seller calling you, okay? So let me, All right, we still only have two comps. One is a distress, one is 65. Some of these older neighborhoods, yeah, they, they're harder to find comps because what happens is investors like myself, when we sell our, our houses, we don't sell them on the MLS. We sell them for sale by owners. So those comps don't go on here. Um, and it works the same way for a lot of the uh, home investor companies. And some, some guys, um, I know one specifically, Houston, um, Houston buyers, the way they do it is they, they farm this area also and they also farm uh, 77016. And what they do is that they, sell the they buy the house, they sell it on their own, and they, the first couple houses, they make it look really nice. Well, not just those couple, but they try to make the house really nice, and they sell it above what the normal market value is. So like, let's say, let's say they're supposed to sell it at seventy thousand. They make it look really nice, and they try to push it for seventy-five. And then the next time around, they push it for eighty thousand dollars. And all all these time, they keep those uh, those the sold HUDs to themselves. They don't put it on the MLS for you guys to see it. Now, they continue to do that. <coughs> 
the next time around when they buy a house, they can easily sell it for 80000 because they can, sh they can show their HUDs to the appraiser and say, look, this is how much we've been selling these houses for. See? N now, none of you guys, you guys looking at the MLS, you don't know what the true value is. And they will pay more than what you will pay for it because they know what the true value is. They already built it up. But they were able to do that is because they formed that specific area and that's it. So they kind of created their own value within that area. Okay. Isn't that considered fraud? No, no, it's not fraud. Uh, because the reason why it's not fraud because they don't they don't do it like number one they don't sell it to to a fake buyer that's just pulling out money. They're selling it to real buyers. They just what they did was they created you know the a really desirable home. And they put in uh, really desirable financing in so they can get the top dollar for that house. And they, they're not going to go to, they're not going to sell those houses for 100000 No, I mean, it's still going to be, they, they don't like way overdo it because they'll throw themselves out of the, the, the you know, the, uh, the other houses in that neighborhood. Th those are what those people can afford, up to $90,000. And so, so they, 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 they try their best to leverage the top end of the market by doing that. In, that. in that case, do they use their own appraiser company, appraisal company no. also, or do they have the buyer choose who they want? They, they don't need to use their own appraisers. They, they just let the buyer um, or the mortgage company for the buyer to get, their own, to get their appraisers. They fashion their HUDs to that appraiser to support the, the value. Doesn't realdata.net have non-MLS closings on it? In other words, straight from the courthouse? Um, some, but you have to understand the courthouse doesn't know what the value of the homes are. They don't know, they have no record of how much of the homes are sold for for the Houston courthouses. In some other states where they have to pay um, I think document fee and, and it reflects the, va the, the uh, sales price of the home, but here in, in, in state of Texas, we don't do that. We don't, so the courthouse doesn't have a record of how, how much the house was sold for. The only time the appraisal district has a record is the new owner fill it out the form, fill out the form, and put in how much they bought the house for. And a lot of time, you know, they don't do that because now they just increase their, their tax bill. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to here again, and let's go to four fifty four. But this time, let's put the square footage in. So we'll do we'll do 800 square feet to 1,200 square feet. Uh, let's see how many we can find first. If we need to narrow that in more, then we'll narrow it in more. <coughs> 48, okay, that's not too bad. All right, let me, let me make my, my uh, thing bigger here for you guys to see. Okay, now you, you, you're out into a much bigger area now. You're, you're out into the whole 454 key map page. Um, and based on this, I mean, your comp goes from 32000 to $160,000. You can't really use this. So what you would want to do is you look at the key map page and find out what is the other key map grid next to the one that you're, 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 um, of your subject property. So um, 454W, W, you have to look at it because um, it's, it's divided into four. Does anybody have a key map book here? No, please don't. Oh, good job. What, could you give me what's left and right and top and bottom of 454W? 454W. Right. Four four X is to the right, okay. And, uh, T, okay, hold on. Okay. Oh wait. So it's almost. 
let's say so we, we can use w we can use x we can use s and t okay let's do that w 454 s and 454 t all right uh, you still not get me enough comps but I mean this that was the same house yes this is a different house that also sold for 32.4. So another an investor bought it. As you guys can see, what you guys can wholesale the houses for. Can you see that now? 32, 33,000. So if you buy it at 20, 20, 25,000, you're pretty yeah. safe. And it, even if you have to buy it at 30,000, are you okay with making three grand? Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Um, is this enough for this comps, or are you guys? Do you guys feel comfortable that you're able to do this? For you to wholesale it? For your house, which is in a nicer, um, your house is nicer condition and it has a tenant in there? Okay. Okay, can you give me that web address to look at a picture? J E H Properties. You guys see the pictures? Yeah. Okay. Front side of the house, other side. Where's the front of the house? Uh, Down here? I, think, I, think so I see. Okay. But um, for you, this house, you, well, you really should be listing it as a three bedroom. Does that addition has a closet? For it to be considered as a bedroom, okay. When, for it to consider as a living space, it has to have AC, okay, air condition. For it to be considered as a bedroom, it has to have a closet and a window. So if it doesn't have a closet, if it doesn't have a window, it cannot be considered as a bedroom. Not here in Houston. I only know Houston, so. I don't know what the, 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 the local laws are in other states. Hey Tim, on that previous page you showed the active and sold. Um, on the active it says 75 or 65. Is that a pretty good um, guide for ARV? No. Uh, the active listings, how much is selling for? Is it a good, you know, a good guide for the after repair value? The answer is no. Uh, if you take that and you deduct about five percent, you know, five percent, three to five percent, then it's more accurate. People always tend to list it for more. Okay. Is there a square footage requirement on the bedrooms as well? Um, I'm. I don't know. Eight. I would assume there is. Section eight does. Section eight does. Yeah. How, do you, Do you remember what the numbers yeah, are? I had it at home. It's okay. Piece of paper. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't know what the requirement is, but norm I mean, the, the smallest bedroom I've ever seen is like a, a, a 9 by 10, you know. Uh, that's really small, I mean, can you imagine? Uh, but if you, at, at least a 10 by 10, I think it's okay. 100 square feet for the bedroom should be fine. Okay. Uh, for Joel, how, how much should he uh, wholesale this house for? If... The addition has a, win has a window and a, and a closet. I would be wholesaling this house for about $37,000. Or, yeah. Um, and I would wholesale it to a landlord who's going to keep that tenant in there. Okay? So that's, that's, how, that's how you can decide.
you, um, are you going to get punished? <laughs> I'm going to take away his folder and pass it out to everyone here. <laughs> I, I own them all, so you can't do anything. Um, so if you had a similar house but closer to U of H, would the value go up because of the location? Um, it depends. It depends on how close it is. University of Houston. If you're talking about Scott Street, then the answer is no. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about like right alongside on Willow, where U, U of H is, then the answer is uh, possibly yes because you have a much higher demand for landlords <laughs> buying and rent out to the students. Yeah, I mean this one's on Holman, which is I guess one of the busier streets. Okay. Um, kind of between U of H and 288. It's probably no more than a quarter mile from U of H. Okay. Just right straight down Holman. Yeah. It, it, it really depends. If, if it's not immediately um, close to U of H, then chances are it, it would just be considered as one of these other ones. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got that. Thank you. <laughs> Did you file your affidavit of memorandum? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I memorize all those addresses, you know. <laughs> Yesterday, um, Jay mentioned about, you know, he, he mentioned when I told him to file the memorandum of, um, of contract that I wasn't sure if it's gonna work. The reason why I wasn't sure is because his contract already expired. They already have a new contract. So you can't put a memorandum of uh, contract on an expired contract. But here's your risk. If, if the seller, in this case it's his friend, so the seller's not gonna fight him for it. But if the seller really wanna fight you for it, you would lose because you don't have a real contract. So you would have to release that or you get in trouble. Um, and so that's why I said that you know, it, might, it might not work. But if the seller uh, don't give you a hard time and willing to pay you off, then, then, then great, that's when it works. Now, if you have an active contract, so if you record your, memo, your affidavit immediately after you write your contract, then that's, that's totally valid, okay? All right. Um, that's good enough for comps. I guess since we're talking about the different neighborhoods, let me go ahead and give you some, some guys some stats here. Kim, I have a question. Yes. Um, in the same area, 454W, I have a property at 2222 Jensen. Okay. But, um, it's a TV repair shop, and they say it's supposed to be a commercial mm -hmm. property, um, but they can convert it to a house. Mm -hmm. So it's on a 9,900 square foot okay. lot. But uh, I mean, for wholesaling, how much do you think the property in that area would value at if it's both residential and commercial? If it could use for both, I mean, in a desirable area, then it's it, not desirable. I know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's in a desirable area, and you have a house that that can use be, uh, for both residential and commercial, especially if it's you know if it's in the type of neighborhoods that other houses are that way as well, then there's value into it being you're able to convert into a com commercial um, property. But in, the, uh, in your specific area, it doesn't ha increase the value at all. And it actually, mm -hmm. it, it might even decrease the value because you know, it depends on what, what other, are there other houses next to it or other commercial next to it? Yes, there's a house to the left of it and then there's an apartment to the right of it. Yeah. It's a. Uh, yeah, so, so that, that, I mean, if you convert into a, a home, then it will have the same value as those other houses in that neighborhood. Okay. And it will be easier for you to sell it as a home than trying to sell it as a, as a um, hmm. commercial property because okay. you have more buyers. Thank you.
All right, let me see if I can adjust the volume up a little bit. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing. Can you guys hear me better now or still same? Very low, very low, still very low. Let me see. Level. Okay, I'm testing again. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing. That's, is that getting better? It's fading in and out. Is there any better? Any better? It's getting worse. Scan was. Scan was testing one, two, three. Now it's off. <laughs> it's totally off now. Testing one, two, three. Can you guys hear me? Nope, they can't hear me. They can't hear me. Can you hear me? Is that better? It's pretty loud. It's, it's kind of loud. Put it back to the way it was. Is yeah, that, is that, that what it was? Slow. All right. You guys prepare. I'm going to walk out. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, good. It's, it's better. All right. For those of you who come up to that mic, please talk closer to the mic. All right. I'm echoing now. Okay. I mean, used to be really good with this stuff, but it's been so long. <laughs> I, uh, when I was in, in, in middle school and high school, I loved to play around with uh, stereo equipments and stuff. Now I'm completely out. Well, no? Sounds fine, right? Am I, am I okay? I'll, I'll try to talk louder. Okay? All right. How about that? That's probably better. Okay, let's talk, I talked about uh, the, you, using the census data to, to teach you guys about the different areas, the different zip codes that you can concentrate in, so that way you can decide which zip code or which key map page to farm, and so you can know the value. Now, the U.S. Census data, I believe they use, um, they, probably, they probably use the, the county appraisal district value. So uh, I can see that it's off a little bit. In, here in Houston, I see it off anywhere from, you know, about uh, twenty to $15,000. But this is also only a, a median value, not, not the actual value. Okay, and this here is for the entire U.S. You, you're all going to have access to this on the website, so I'm just displaying it here for you. Um, what I have done is I, I took the census data and I, I extracted only the data that I was interested in. Okay, let's go specifically to Houston so that will be, be more applicable to you guys. Uh, the, the way I determine Houston in this case is I take everything that starts with 77. Um, you know, XXX in the zip code, and, and that's how these values are. And so you can sort, when you go on the website, you'll be able to sort by the, by the median value. And so you can tell, you know, if, if, if you see median values that are like, like here, un, you know, under $50,000, that's pretty much your low income neighborhoods right there. See, all these, so all of these are your lower income neighborhoods, okay? Now, you, once you go over to the, to the, to the 50s and $60,000, you you're moving into your moderate income neighborhoods now, okay? Up to about $80,000 or so. Now, these are median, so it's not the actual retail value of, of those houses in there, okay? But now you have your moderate. Now, if you go beyond that, you have your, your middle and your high income. So you, 
for, for most of you, you can ignore that, all right? And then it also give you the total number of units in that uh, zip code. So, and this is for residential properties. So it'll give you a total number of units. So you can see how many houses are in, in that zip code and an estimated of how many of those houses are vacant. Yeah. So you, and you can sort it too. Like, like let's say I sort by, um, by ratio and, oh, okay, I sort by. <laughs> no, it's okay. Because what, I'm, I'll, I'll tell, you, tell you guys now, you don't want to, you, expand, what's vacant, yes, oh, oh, the other way. Okay. You see, I mean, you have s some of these neighborhoods that has a lot of units that are vacant, but look at the ratio, it's only 33%, because there's a lot of houses in that zip code. So you look at that, look at this zip code, my goodness, 73% uh, vacant. Mm. So that could be a war zone too. I wonder why. Yeah. You know? So, so you, you don't necessarily want to go after the ones with the most. No. And, and, and also, um, also, on some of the ones that are like your, your borderline war zone or your middle income that has a lot of vacancies, you will also see a lot of com um, you know, competition in, the, in, in those areas, okay? And, and then I also broke down how, how many, the percentage of um, homes that are owner-occupied versus tenant-occupied. You see, remember I talked about that, so you can, so you would know what neighborhood is your moderate income, what neighborhood is your, your low income, and which neighborhood is more desirable if you're going to fix it up and detail it. In a neighborhood that's 82% owner-occupied, those neighborhoods are really good for retail. Okay, you, you, I mean, if you need your money, once you, once you wholesale enough to, to, um, to meet or exceed your monthly cash flow, and you find a, a house in the neighborhood that has a high percentage of owner, uh, occupants, you know, I mean, you don't, you don't have to be too scared about rehabbing in those neighborhoods and retelling them, okay, because they're more desirable. People want to live in there. But in the neighborhoods that high, have high percentage of um, tenant occupied, people don't want to live in, the people don't want to buy those houses. They don't, they don't mind renting in there because it's cheap. But they're not your best, you know, clients, okay? And right here, total of occupants, uh, how many, you know, how many um, households that are living in those units. So you have all those data. That's pretty cool, right? Yes. Yeah. All right, I'll give you guys something even better. Uh, and this is only for Houston that I, that I have, Harris County that I have access to. But what I've done is I also take it a step further and identify for you guys. I broke it down in um, homes that are value under ninety thousand dollars, and I broke them down into zip codes and then also into key maps. And I also broke down the homes that are value between ninety thousand to one hundred twenty thousand dollars in zip code and in key map. And you can see my count for these zip codes of how many sellers own the house for at least fifteen years or more and how many sellers own the house for at least 10 years or more. Wouldn't it ni be nice to know where to best farm these people? Do you want to go after neighborhoods that has no equity or do you want to go after neighborhoods that have a lot of equity? Not equity. Exactly, right? And you guys are so lucky because you have all these stuff. I mean, when I started, have you ever heard any other people teach you these and giving you these kind of data? No. No, why? <laughs> well, number one, because I created it. Number two, I mean, there's not a whole lot of the, the national gurus, they can't give you this data. No. Because it's very specific to the local market. The local gurus, uh, number one, a lot of them don't know about it or don't know how to compile these kind of data. Or they don't um, want to tell you. Or they don't want to tell you because they don't want you to compete with them. That's why I made you, uh, you know, you guys have the option to split the deals with me 
So it's no big deal to me that you're successful because it'll make me successful. Like I said, I have so many leads. I don't have time and I don't have the staff, the, the, the resources to, to work through all these leads. So that's why I'm training you guys to help me make more money. And I mean, I mean, at the same time, you're gonna make money too. I'm giving you a lot of detailed information. So it, it's a win-win situation. Okay. Now, zip codes can, can be, you know, can be quite big. So I even broke it down into key map pages for you. So if you buy that key map book, and you can buy it at the key map store, you can go to bon Barnes and Noble, they, they'll have it. Sam's Club, Office Depot. So all those places will have it. It's only like $35, right? Not at Sam's, how much is that? 24, yeah, so $25 can get you the, the book and then you just pick the key map page and you go and you drive them. Okay, now, just be, you, you, the way you, you do this is you combine this with that vacancy list so you can tell which neighborhood to farm. Now, I know by default a lot of you guys are gonna go for the ones with the top. And what you have to understand is the ones that are at the top you're competing with me and you're competing with a lot of other big dogs out there. Huh? <laughs> well, not me personally, but my staff. Um, and so you can't, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying you can't find deals. You will find deals in those areas. It's just you have more competition. But at the same time, you know, you also have more choices to, to, uh, to work on. And, and I mentioned about the, the other company that you know, talked to the seller before I did, three months before I did, offered them 33000 and I talked to them a few months later and bought it for 30000 Why? It's timing. It's not just, you know, it's not just the fact that you're farming in that neighborhood, but it could have been that when you talk to that seller at that time, they weren't ready to sell yet, or their siblings haven't agreed yet. But because you follow up with them every 30 days, you know when they're ready for you and a lot of investors don't follow up. That's why that tickler system is so important for you guys. So that way you, you, you don't need to remember who you need to follow up. Every day you just pick that folder and those are the people you need to follow up. There's no guessing into that. When you talk to a seller who may not be ready to sell, do you try for an option on the property? Well, there's no point to put an option if you can't get the price that you want. And if, they don't, if they're not ready to sell, they won't give you an option. Why would they want to give you an option? So. Huh? Because you pay them for it. Well, but you don't want to pay for a lot of, I mean, you don't want to put out $5,000 for an option, right? You only want to pay 100 bucks for an option. And so why would they, they don't care for your $100. They're not in a financial distress. And if they care that much for my option, I might not want to give them my option. <laughs> they might take my $100 and run away. Okay. So, so, this, so the under 90000 is your, your low income. And same thing, here's your moderate income neighborhoods. Okay. And I have account for those as well. Um, the, these kind of data, you can't just go out there and, and there's like some website that gives you these counts. What I did, uh, there's a lot of things that I did, but um, I, 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 I got the Harris County data, the, county, uh, the appraiser district, I got all of their data, it was like over a million entries in there. And then I also um, compared that with the county clerk's office to check the deep, uh, the deep dates. And so using all these, I mean, I, I don't do it manually, I, um, I have my uh, software developer to create the software to, to look at these data and, and analyze them and give me these counts. So there's a lot of things that went behind the scene that you don't know. For you guys, it's like, oh, the numbers are here. It's cool. <laughs> okay. Huh? You're funny, I like you. <laughs> Thank you. How are you guys enjoying the event so far? Except for what? The coffee. Are you allergic to coffee? Oh, no. Uh, I've never heard anybody allergic to coffee before. 
Yes, sir. The, uh, the MLS the site that you just showed us to do the comps. The temple that, that I was running comp? Yes. Yes. Did you tell us yesterday that that was going to be included in, that we will be able to get access to that? No, that's for agents, real estate agents. I, but I thought yesterday you said something about there was a link or something that... To the steward title, the property info. Okay. Yeah. Trying to get back to where we were last night. Okay. What's the next strategy? Okay. All right. Um, one more thing that... I forgot to mention, you guys all have these checks, and you're probably wondering what is this for? You're paying us. Huh? You're paying us. That I'm paying you? No, it's even better. <laughs> After you make an offer to the seller and they haven't agreed, this is one of your follow-up system. You write down the price that you offer them, and you write down their name, the price, as if you're writing them a check. You sign, well, you don't sign your name, but where it says sign, you said, call me to get this check signed. Okay? And so now you confirm, you reconfirming to them that you are offering them this amount and you have a check ready for them. Okay, this is in one of your follow-up system. You don't need to do this if they already accept your offer. This is only if they did not accept your offer. Huh? Um, actually, that's because that's. Can we? Okay, I'll, I'll just try to be behind here. The phone number. It's actually this is a real phone number. It's Christine's phone number because this is this is the check that she she used. This is actually what we use. Okay, so so you you will change all that stuff. You know. You buy these, ch yeah, you don't keep this. This is my, this is my actual office address and everything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, unless, unless you want the office to call me, which yeah, is right. perfectly fine. <laughs> um, you buy these at Office Depot. It's called Versa Checks. It's the brand of the checks. Like in the bottom here, it'll, it'll tell you the brand. And it will even give you the form, Form 1000 Classic. You don't need all these blank space. Um, the reason why my checks has all these blank space is sometimes I'll write something in here. You know, I write a letter to them in here. But if, if you're just sending a check only, you can just buy the ones that with just the checks. Okay? And so you, you write down the date and your offer price, and you, you, in the memo, you put the address of the property and where you're supposed to endorse the check or sign the check, you just put. Um, Call, call me at this number to get this check signed. And if you send them one time and they haven't uh, replied to you, you, know, to, to you and you, you think you can increase the, the price a little bit, the next time you follow up, you just increase that price and send it to them again. Okay. But I also try to call them. The only time, you know, your, your follow up should be always call and then send them a mail if they still haven't, uh, if they didn't say yes to you on the phone. Do you have a question, Terry? Can you come up, please? Okay, could you go to the mic, please? <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> I don't need the five leads. Uh, just a testimonial to that check. Tim showed me that probably about four or five weeks ago, months ago, about a month ago, two months ago, something like that. Uh, we mailed out 500. We had 25 calls. So that's a pretty good ratio in direct marketing. So if you doubt the validity of trying to test that, don't. It works. So <laughs> he's, he, he, what he's just talked about is a little bit different from what I just said. I, I told you guys to use this check as a follow-up. He used it as a lead generation. So he mails this check out to like the entire neighborhood and to see who, who calls. You can also do that as well, and that's why the space down here allows you to write letters for that. Uh, in the CDs that you get, you will have the one that I sent out for the pre-foreclosure people. So you just change the language about foreclosures and
talks more about the cash, and that's what he learned it from was from the last um, the foreclosure boot camp that I did. But uh, yeah, the checks works really, really well. I mean, which who may, how many in here would like to receive a check from me? Okay, would you call me once you get the check? Yeah, okay, there. The sellers feels the same way. Hey, Tim. Um, using Terry's method, what number did you put in that check? Like 25,000 or what, what, what figure? Okay, if you're using his method, well, I, I taught in the, um, in the uh, pre-foreclosure, but I normally put between ten to $15,000. Not because I'm offering them ten to $15,000 for the house, but I'm telling them that you know, some of the sellers that I bought the house from, that's how much cash they net. So you, can, so you can do something like that. So you can put a check for, or you can put it for more. Remember, it's always, when they call you, like in your case, if you mail it out to one of these ugly houses in the neighborhood, uh, in the low-income neighborhood, you can put a check for $40,000 or $30,000. Okay, and if they call you and just say, well, you know, that's how much we've been buying in your neighborhood. So if, if you know if, if it's in a neighborhood where you've been buying twenty thousand and you put twenty thousand dollars, so you kind of like preframe the mind of the seller uh, of how much you're buying in, in that neighborhood, okay? And then another thing, a lot of you guys are kind of scared to talk to the sellers because it's your first deal. What I've done when I created the Association of uh, Real Estate Investors, I created this brochure. Okay, it's in, it's in your binder. And because all of you guys have, um, are now, have access to my website, a member of my website, you are now a member of the Community Real Estate Investors Association. So when you meet with the seller, you can bring this brochure with you. Okay, and, and if, so, if, so you can tell them that I'm a, you know, you introduce yourself and you tell them you're a member of Community Real Estate Investors Association and if they want to see more credibility, you can give it to them and you can tell them that this is the, uh, the 10 code of ethics that you abide by because you're a part of this association. I mean, this is kind of like, you know, like realtors, uh, but without license, <laughs> okay? It, because it, it's giving you that credibility. And not only that, but what I did was I created uh, eight different ways that real estate investors buy houses and depending on what you're planning to offer to the seller, you, own, you, you insert that in here. So you would want all cash. You would want maybe um, an owner financing. And you know, maybe, maybe a subject too, OK? So you would take the, only, the, only the three that you might be interested in, in talking to these sellers about. And down here to explain to you, what it is and how the transaction works, they even have pictures for them. So you can, you can just put it in here and you can give this to the seller, okay? So, so it builds a lot of credibility I instantly without you being an, uh, an ex experienced investor. And if you need more of this, you just um, call or email our office and you can order them. Um, depending on the quantity that you order, when, when I print 2,000 of these at a time, it cost me $2, $2 per, per uh, brochure. So, you know, if you order a few hundred at a time, I can just give it to you at my cost. But if you only order like 5, 10, then I'll probably have to charge you a little bit more. But you don't, I mean, it depends on you. If you give this to the seller and let them keep it, then that's when you need more. But if you're just using it to hand it to them, just to build that credibility, and then get them to you know, read it and take it back or something if they don't sell you the house. If they sell you the house, they can keep it, right? You can afford to buy <laughs> another one. But if they, if they don't sell you the house, you can take it back and, and use it on the next seller, okay? But regardless, I mean, $2 for each of these is very inexpensive and it builds instant credibility for you guys. Everything that I do is for a reason, to make your life a lot easier. Don't you guys agree? Okay. Actually, let's. I have nine thirty. Um, okay. 
Okay, we'll go for another 23 minutes and then we'll take a small break, okay? Do you need the break now? Or? Can you guys go on? Uh, huh? Break? Okay. All right, let's, um, any questions before we run our break then? Because some, apparently some of you guys need to break now. Any questions? Okay, I mean, you'll feel more than confident to be able to do at least one deal in the next 30 days. Most of you, good job. Okay, and, and we're, all, we're only halfway through. Good. So good. We're gonna go, so, some of you need a break, so we'll go ahead and take a 10 minutes break. But during the break, here's what you can do. I, I did a little, um, little thing that, that I, I think it'll be kind of fun. My assistant, Christine out there, and UV out there has this big check, this um, big green check. What I want you to do is go out there and write in the amount of how much you, you, your goal is to make in the next 30 days, okay? I don't want you to write something outrageous, just something that is, um, you know, very predictable, and, and it could be something between three to ten thousand dollars. And write, so you write down what your goal is, and then she'll take a picture of you digital and she'll print it out for you. So you keep that with you in, in your binder, okay? And I also have a digital uh, copy. So by the end of thirty days, well, or on when we on our follow up call, we'll talk about if you guys have achieved that. Okay, let's take our break. Going. But I don't want you guys to be dependent on my leads because, because I have to teach you guys not, to, not only to make money in the 30 days, but you, you have to be able to do this on your own so you can consistently make that money every 30 days. If I just hand everything to you, you know, then you get lazy or you, you, won't, you won't perform as well. Okay? I mean, I'll do my best. That's why I provided you with all these stats, all these tools. Um, I provide you with you know, I mean, everything that, that, that I can but you still have to take action. You still have to go out there, identify your neighborhood, study your neighborhood, drive the neighborhood, or hire someone to drive the neighborhood for you, get those vacant houses, track them down, calling the sellers. You still have to do all that stuff. I mean, I, you know, it would be nice if I can just ask you guys, well, you know, give, me, give me your bank account now, I'll wire you the money every 30 days. But. <laughs> But I can't do that. My, my wife will get mad at me for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wholesaling houses quickly. All right. Is now a good time for questions? Yes. Go ahead. I, I have a question about the research tools, Acurin to Merlin Daily, Link to America. I'm an individual, a private individual, don't have a business entity. So the best I could sign up for was uh, Merlin Data's um, public record search. Is that going to be sufficient to do no. this kind of work? Uh, for the public record search, then, I mean, maybe for the advanced phone search, like if they have unlisted phone numbers and stuff, then that will be fine. Uh, and then meanwhile, you can either partner up with somebody in the room who has accounts with accurate and Merlin Data, or you can um, start and create your, your corporation now and then apply for it. And then in the back of the binder, I already have the forms just, just you know, um, based on what the sample form that I filled out to create the corporation, mm -hmm. use that and create your own. And if you, you know, if you need help with that, you can either talk to your CPA or your, your attorney to help you with that. Or you can go to in the internet. There's a lot of internet websites that will help you create it for like, you know, $75 and they'll help you create your corporation. I was just going to say, I did mine through Click and Ink, and it was whatever the filing fee was, I think plus 107 or 150 okay. but they create your minutes, you know, the whole nine yards for you within an hour or so. It's very, very easy. Okay, what was the website? It's www.click. It's actually ampersand, but on the website they spell it out, Click and Ink, which stands for Click and Incorporate. Okay. There you go. That's one. If you go on Google and search for, um, you know, forming Texas Corporation. There's a lot of websites that will do it uh, very inexpensively. Is the corporation, is the corporation better than LLC? They are d different um, for, I, I'll just tell you what I do. It's not 
legal advice or tax advice. For houses that I flip, meaning I wholesale or I retail, I put in my C Corp. For houses that I keep as rental, I put them in an LLC. Now some of you, you know, heard about land trust and stuff. Uh, land trust is not, uh, land trust is not really um, a, a, a corporation type entity. It's just a shield. It, it shields you or your company from the public eye of who really own that property. So, so that's what land trusts are for. So your land trust could be the owner of the property and your corporation or your LLC would be the beneficiary of that land trust. Okay? All right. Wholesaling quickly. First, you can, if, if you don't, you know, if, if you're not in an area where, you, like you're not in the Houston area, for example, where you, you know, where you can just post it on my website or on Doug's website to wholesale your deals to other investors, uh, you can start building your buyers list. And building your buyers list, you can do, you know, one of many of these things. You can call, you can go to the Section 8 uh, housing office in your, in your area and get a list of all these Section 8 available properties. And you would call those property managers or those landlords up. If you're in the, the Houston area, I already um, made a copy of that list for you in the back of your binder. So you just call those people up and then you start building up your list. You call them up and ask them, are you still l looking for more rental properties to buy? If so, what areas are you buying in? What price range are you buying in? Uh, you, you're buying in. And if they said, no, I'm not interested in looking for any more houses to buy, you can ask them, well, do you have any uh, houses that you want get to get rid of it quickly? I, you know, I am an investor. I do buy houses um, cash. And so, now, not only they are your buyers list, but they could be also potential sellers for you because they, they, they might have been trying to rent this house for a while and they couldn't rent it out, so now they, they, they want to go after the Section 8 uh, tenants as you know, the last resort. What does Section 8 mean? It's a... Mike, she said, Michael. The, what is Section 8? <laughs> Every time I get up and somebody makes a question, owes me a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Section 8 is a government housing program uh, that helps individuals um, with low income. They pay for, they, 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 you know, they pay like for most of their rent, if not for all of their rents. So the, the county you have, like here in Houston, you have the city of Houston Section 8 and you have the Harris County Section 8. And they give them these vouchers. So let's say your house, you rent your house, um, say you have a, a three bedroom home that the Section 8 will pay up to $1,000 for it. And they will give that, they will, Section 8 or the government will give you $800 and the tenant will give you $200 a month. So, so that's what that is. And normally these, well, these tenants fall into one or two categories. They are either the, the good tenants, but they just very dependent on the uh, government assistance. So they'll be in your house for a long time. Or the, the, you know, or the other tenants who are not so bad and They'll, they'll be in your house uh, shortly, and they'll mess up your house, and they break their, their contract with the government, and they have to, you know, they'll, they'll be kicked out of the house. Um, and so you can get the, you know, the good ones that will stay there for a long time, or the not so good one. Um, and and that's that's what that is. So you contact all those those landlords. They section eight. Rental properties are typically in your moderate income and low income neighborhoods. And so they, they're ideal for you. They, 
the, the mind is kind of houses that I'm teaching you guys to look for. Now, they do, Section 8 will not rant or will not provide fi um, assistance in war zone areas, which is an area that I tell you guys to stay away from anyways. Okay. Okay. So that's how you build up your bias list. Uh, and like I said, you can list on my website at hotboggingproperties.com. You can list on Doug's website at myhousedeals.com. You can, for, for those of you who are out of town or you want to find out of town investors, you can list it on craigslist.org and backpage.com. There's a lot of, because um, it's a national website and it's free. It doesn't cost you anything and you get investors from out of town uh, calling you. Tim, just uh, a note back to Section 8, uh, my experience in California, uh, if somebody's on Section 8 and they thrash your property, you report it, they'll never be on Section 8 again. That's correct. So it isn't a threat when they move in, just let them know that you know they need to take care of the property because sometimes people are afraid of renting to Section 8. Exactly. That is the case here in Texas as well. Okay, you can call on those We Buy Houses ads in the newspaper, in the green sheet, and your 50 nickels. Yes. Tim, um, I think on myhousedeals.com I read somewhere that there has to be at least 15000 in equity to post on that site. Do you have the same qualifications on hot bargain properties? No, I don't. And what about those others? Do you have to have a certain amount of no. equity? No. Um, on myhousedeals.com is the only one that has that um, criteria. He wants... He, wants, he only wants deals that have at least $15,000 in equity or more on his website. But on my website and other websites, you can just post it. Because, I mean, you know, the house might not have $15,000 in equity, but if it has a good cash flow for, an, for a landlord investor, they might buy it. So um, you call on those We Buy Houses ads and say, hey, I got a property I want to wholesale. You know, do you, you want to buy it? And... If they say, no, they're not interested in that property, you can find out what area they do buy in and what price range they buy in, and you can build up your buyers list that way. Again, you can also ask them, do you have any property that you want to sell? Because I have a list of investors that buy houses for me all the time that I can, um, you know, I, I can sell your house as well. So they're not only your buyers, but they're also your sellers. Like I said, I, I buy houses from other investors all the time, and then I wholesale it to another investor. Um, and, and, and so don't always, when you talk to other investors, don't just look at them as a buyer source for you. Look at them as a seller source for you as well. What happens a lot of time is because you guys know the value in some of these areas more than they do, and you, you build up a good buyer's list, and so you end up having, you, you, you're able to wholesale deals for more than what other investors can. And so that's why, just like the example I gave yesterday, how the guy called me, because he has no investors that can close in days, but I do. And if, if I don't have anybody in the closing day, I can close in days. And so, so, but if you build up a good buyers list of buyers that can close within a week, you know, then, then whenever you have a deal that can close, that needs to close very quickly, you, you can be the one that um, make that transaction and you can be the one that makes that 20000 you know, 20 thousand dollars for, for that flip. So it's very important that you build up a good buyer's list. You can place a classify ad in the paper um, and it will say handyman special. If you go to the next slide, uh, you can say something pretty simple, handyman special, cheap cash. This is what I learned from Ron LeGrand and your phone number. And you can, I mean, you can just keep on running this ad uh, forever or, or until you build up a good buyer's list. You might not have any house, but just run this ad and if they call you, then you, you tell them that you, you know, you're always getting in inventory. You always have houses uh, come in and you sell them very quickly. So you will put them on your buyer's list so that as soon as you have a house, that you will, you will contact them, okay? Uh, 
All right. You can also use those, um, those neon color poster boards that you can find at like the grocery store or at Walgreens or Office Depot. And you can handwrite, um, you know, handyman special, cheap cash, must sell fast, uh, the price, and you can put flexible or motivated seller. Uh, the reason why you use terms like fle flexible and motivated seller and handyman special is, is because all those investors out there, they've been trained by Ron LeGrand, Carlton Sheets, to look for these type of terms. <laughs> and so, and so that when, when they see these terms, they, they, they know to call on those houses. Okay? And so <laughs> that's why you use those terms. And you can put this all around that neighborhood. Because when you put it all around the neighborhood, not only will you find wholesale um, investors that buy in those neighborhoods, but you will also find tenants that now are ready to buy a house. And depending on the neighborhood, but some, I mean, especially, especially in a neighborhood that has a lot of Hispanics, hey. they make, hey. here's why. They make, a, they make a lot of money, and so a lot of time it's cash money or it's mattress money. I've sold a house. It was a retail house. I sold for $99,000, and I asked the guy, well, you know, um, how soon can you close? He goes, I can close whenever you want. I'm, I'm buying it all cash. So we close in five days. I mean, so <laughs> in some neighborhood, they have a lot of money, so and, and, and they don't mind fixing it themselves because... Uh, there's plenty of time I sell, I sell houses to them. And, no, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. You know, I, I fix up the house nicely. I put new, brand new carpet in. And they, they tell me, Tim, I don't care for the new carpet. I'm about to put tile in. So they tear it up and put tile in. <laughs> so they make very good buyers. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm wondering about a double, double close. Okay. We'll, Is that? We'll talk about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, hold on real quick. Let me remove this cursor that's on, that's on my screen. Okay. All right. So you put this all around the neighborhood, at least 20 to 30 of them. Okay. And if, if they get taken up, you know, you put it out again. Uh, you put a couple of them on, um, at the house. And if you can put an arrow sign, that would be, that would be even better. So they, they know to go to that house. But if you don't want to, if you don't want to, if you're buying your, if you, when you're building up your buyers list, then you don't want to know where that house is. You want them to call you so you can take down the information. But once you already have a good buyers list built up, then, then you can just put the arrow to the house and let them go in there and look at it themselves. Uh, especially if the house is vacant. Now, if the house is occupied, you can't, then, then you don't want to have any arrow go into the house. You want them to call you so you can schedule the appointment to to show the house. And the way I tell my sellers is, well, my investors need to come out and inspect the house. Okay? One time, I had 40-something investors that came to come out. The seller's like, what is going on? I go, I go well, I work with a really big group of investors. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, so, and so, you know, I, I got to, you know, because your house needs a lot of work, and, and it might not meet you know, a lot of these investors' um, criteria. So I, I got to make sure I bring them all out here and the ones that are willing to deal with, with your house that needs a lot of work, um, that, that they'll buy, you know, they'll, they'll buy your house. And so I, I tell them, I work with investors, and I'm going to bring them out to look at the house, to inspect the house. And they understand that, okay? It's just, it's not going to be very often that you bring out 40 buyers like, like what happened to me. Um, but, I mean... It was, it, was a, it was a decent deal, so that's what happened. Okay. If you can do other things to make the house, if it's vacant, there's other things you can do. Um, you, can, you, know, you can put, I mean, I've seen, I haven't done it, but I've, I've seen people put flags, uh, like those, um, those party flags, uh, like in the front yard and and putting on the tree, just really decorate it so that way everybody who drive past that street will see this house, okay, and call on your sign. So you, so you can do that. Uh, it takes a little bit more work, so that's why I don't, I don't do it. I, 
I'm a little bit more lazy. Um, you know, and also I'm kind of limited on, 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 on manpower too. But for you, I mean, the more work that you're willing to do, the faster you're going to be able to sell this house. Okay, and it works the same way for buying houses. The more vacant houses you find, and that's why I, in your homework I want you to find 100 of them, the more of them you're willing to, I mean, the more you're willing to work to find the sellers, the more chances of you getting, uh, you know, you're getting a, a deal quickly and, 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 you know, more profitably. And same thing on the selling side. The more work you're willing to do to market that house for sale and decorate the, the house, the, the, the higher chance of you, uh, of you being able to sell it quickly. Okay? And so it has to do with price and market. You know, and, and marketing, price and marketing. If you want to sell it quickly without doing any marketing, like selling it in seconds, you set your price correctly and people will buy it really quick. But if you're trying to get the top dollar for your wholesale deal, then you would have to work harder in marketing that, that property so that way you can get your money. Okay. I mentioned yesterday about um, wholesaling for top dollars. One way that you can wholesale for top dollars is, is if you're able to structure somehow that your buyer can buy the house with little or no money down. You know, maybe maybe three to you know maybe three thousand dollars down, and that's all they have to put that down. Okay, and so that's where you structure the either you structure your price attractive enough so that they can find a hard money lender or private lender to be able to loan them the purchase money on the house and also the rehab money. Or if you want a higher price, then you ha you have to be willing to carry back a second. Okay. And we talked about that yesterday, carry back a second so that way they'll be in it with no money. And you still make some money. I mean, I normally, I, I, I never carry back 100% of my wholesale fee. They would have to put down at least three to $5,000 before I'm willing to carry back the rest. Okay, so you don't want to just you know, be in it uh, and not get any money at all. Because once I know that I, I, I got three to $5,000, and if they default, you know, I mean, I can then choose to either foreclose on the house and get it back, or I can just say, oh, forget it. I already made my money. I'll move on to the next deal. But if you, if you didn't get any money, up, upfront money at all, um, then you would be more emotionally tied to the property, and you don't want to do that. Okay. I gave you the phone numbers to the private lenders here in Houston and also the hard money lenders. So you call them up and you find out how much they'll loan, what their criteria are, so that way you know how to um, structure your deal and let your buyers know that, okay? So, so they have access to that. That was yesterday in the, in the very beginning with private lenders and hard money lenders. It's like section one or section two. Okay. Like I said, you take a small down payment, carry back a second, and you can either uh, make them pay a monthly payment with, with interest-only monthly payment, or you can amortize it. And I normally do a six-month balloon or a one-year balloon. I like to do six months and give them the option to extend it for one year if, I, if they need to. But I never do it more than one year. Because what, that, what you're trying to do is you hope that they'll fix up the house and retail it within six months. And if they can't retail it within six months, hopefully it'll be within a year. But that if it ever goes more than a year, I will I force them to have to refinance that property and pay me off. Otherwise, I'll foreclose on it. Okay? So I don't want to wait more than a year for, for my money. That's way too long. So it's, especially if they're going to, if they're a landlord investor, and, and they want to keep the house as a rental property, then once they finish fixing it up, they can just refinance it. So I'll get paid a lot quicker than six months. I might be able to get paid in three months, get my money back. As far as the second interest um, percentage rate, what do you charge them? Or is there a cap that you can't exceed? 
You, you cannot charge more than 18%. I don't know about other states, but that's the case here in Texas. Okay, now, if you do charge more than 18%, the way um, hard money lenders do that is they charge, you, they charge them upfront points. So let's say they charge you five points up front and 18% interest. That's a total of uh, 23%. So they just divide it up. Yeah, it gets really expensive with hard money. That's why, you know, you guys have phone numbers to my private lenders, so. Tim, when you um, take a down payment up front of the three to $5,000 out of your option fee up front, is that upon assignment or upon closing with the buyer? Okay, most of the time, for the earnest money, I take it up front when they sign the contract with me but for my assignment fee or for the down payment, it happens at closing. The reason being is because the seller can back out on you at any time. Or, and so, you know, if you take their money up front and the seller don't close, then you would have to give it back. In case of a lot of buyers, they don't, they don't wanna give it to you up front. Um, and so, yeah, normally I take it at the time of closing. What do you file at the courthouse? You file a second lien to protect your interest in this, or what? When at closing, the title company um, will draw up all the documents and they do all the recording for you, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so they'll they'll do it for you. Instead. Yes, you okay. just tell them that you came back a second, or you're taking a note on your assignment fee, and they'll have their attorney to prepare the documents and and record it for you. But if you do have to do that on your own, I mean. Um, you, yeah, you can just have the note created by an attorney and run it down to the uh, county clerk's office and record it. So everybody in here know how to sell your house pretty quickly now, wholesale it pretty quickly? Yes? <laughs> All right. If you're, you, okay, I'll, I'll go back a little bit. Um, if you're in Houston, I mean, you already have, the, the fact of having access to my website and putting, you post your wholesale deal on there, you already, it gets emailed out to um, over 34, 3,500 investors in Houston already. So it's a huge bias list. Uh, and, and on top of that, if you, um, you know, if you post your, your your, if you build up your own buyers list and put signs in the neighborhoods, I mean, you're, you, you have so many buyers that you should be able to sell very quickly. I got a couple questions on the last slide. You're saying that um, you do like a six months or one year and then have them refinance to pay you off. I thought you're not able to refinance for two years here. On an on a investment property, mm -hmm. you, um, you can refinance the next day. And if you do have to foreclose, how's the foreclosure how, how costly is it to foreclose on a property? How costly is it to foreclose? It's about depending on if they're going to file bankruptcy or not, but assuming they don't file bankruptcy on you, it costs you about thousand bucks to foreclose on it, and it, it takes about forty five days here in Texas. If you're the second lien, how can you foreclose? Anytime you you have a lien, you can foreclose. I thought first lien had the priority. If you're the they second They have the lien. priority. That means that if you foreclose, you would now be responsible for that first lien. You have to pay them off. You can't wipe them out, but now you, now you owe the first lien the money for that house. Talking about foreclosure, um, I took a lawyer and he charged me $800 to foreclose on a second lien. And um, when I received the bill, it was only three letters. I mean, the first letter that he sent out saying to, you know, because he needs 30 days. The second letter was that he actually um, told them that he now is going to proceed. The third one was actually to um, prepare the papers in order to go to the courthouse. And I guess the fourth one was sending me the letter, right? <laughs> My question is this. Is there any way that we can do it ourselves? I mean, is there, 
I mean, $800 is a lot of money for a small second clean that we are taking up, and can we actually do that? Do we have papers? Can we get that? Can we yeah. do that ourselves? Yeah, so you have the necessary documents to do that, and you know the steps to do that, then the answer is yes, you can do that. Um, not yourself, but you can hire like your, one of your friends to become the trustee for you and do that. Okay. So a trustee doesn't necessarily have to be an attorney to foreclose. Um, you can sometimes you can find paralegals that will do it, and they're they're, they're a lot less expensive. But um, I prefer to have an attorney do it so they can do it right, uh, so that way the owner of the house can't come back to me and you know, um, try to redeem the property or anything like that. 